Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Today on the show, I have a very special guest, a very successful guest, and a guest who used to be my boss. His trend-following roots date back to 1983, when he was selected to be part of Richard Dennis's famous turtle program. For those who know me, you probably already guessed it, I'm talking about Jerry Parker, the founder and president of Chesapeake Capital, who has often been described as the most successful turtle ever. Jerry, thanks so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, I'm looking forward to it. Good. Now, Jerry, the turtle story is well known today, but for many years, it was one of the best kept secrets in our industry. At least that's how I remember it. But when I think about how the story has become known over the last 10 years or so, not least due to the big efforts of Michael Covell, who has written some great books on the subject, I'm not aware that any of the Turtles have ever talked about their experience in detail directly to a wider audience. There's been pieces of information made public directly from one or two of the Turtles, but not a lot. So I think today will be quite special because you're able to set the record straight, so to speak, and tell us about this unique experiment that turned out to be such an important part of what we know today as the managed futures slash CTA industry, and in particular, the trend-following world, which is perhaps a better name for what you represent. Now, before we dive into the story itself, perhaps you could start by telling us about your journey leading into the day where you came across the advertisement in the Wall Street Journal. What were you doing in your life at this time? Um, back in 1983, um, I was in public accounting in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, desiring very much to do something more interesting and rewarding. And I had, <clears throat> as a sort of a hobby, was interested in uh, the stock market and trading and it actually come across literature concerning trend following. And I thought that it made a lot of sense to me at the time. So, so discretionary trading was not really part of what you were doing at the time. No, I mean, I think it's kind of amazing that I, from the very beginning, when I first heard about a systematic approach and trend following, um, it just made perfect sense to me and something I wanted to do. I would watch Wall Street Week here in the States, and it's a popular TV show. And on the show, there were some people who talked about trends and things like that, price, price trends and risk control, taking small losses, diversification. And um, it was about all I needed to encourage me to continue down that road. Okay. Now, I'd love to hear about how you found out about this. You know, were you sitting one morning having coffee, reading the paper, and uh, suddenly you see this ad? But before you answer, I want to take you and the listeners back to 1983 by reading what the ad actually said. So it goes like this. Richard J. Dennis and C.D. Commodities is accepting applications for the position of commodity futures trader to expand his established group of traders. Mr. Dennis and his associates will train a small group of applicants 
In his proprietary trading concepts, successful candidates will then trade solely for Mr. Dennis. They will not be allowed to trade futures for themselves or others. Traders will be paid a percentage of their trading profits and will be allowed a small draw. Prior experience in trading will be considered but is not necessary. Applicants should send a brief resume with one sentence giving their reasons for applying. No telephone calls will be accepted. Now, I mean, <laughs> what made you even consider applying to an ad like this? Oh, wow. <clears throat> That's, that, that takes me back. You know, uh, well, as fate would have it, I had heard of Richard Dennis. And so I'm living in Richmond, Virginia. And that would be unlikely that I would even hear about him. But I had received yeah. something or seen an article, a Business Week article, I believe, about Richard Dennis. And um, it was entitled, I believe, The Barefoot Trader. So I guess Rich would okay. uh, sit in his office and do his trades and not wear shoes. Okay, so that's the, that's the title of the article. And uh, so immediately, like you imply, you – you need to have some confidence that this is a legitimate ad. And uh, so it was in the Wall Street Journal. And I would, I mean, I never really would even read the Wall Street Journal ads. I mean, who even reads them? So, but I happened to stumble across it. I immediately thought it was legitimate. And um, I was very excited and hopeful. And I sent my resume in and... And do you remember what reason, I mean, he asked for one sentence in terms of a reason. Do you, do you remember what reason you gave? Because clearly, you know, uh, you, you got to the next stage. So you must have said something that appealed to him. I don't. I don't remember. I think um, every, everyone probably got a response and um, got a, and the response from them was, here is a test, uh, 100 true, false questions that you had to answer and send back and the um it's kind of funny because the whole idea of uh one sentence was was uh exactly what they always wanted uh, regardless when i got the job it, they would ask us a few times a year to respond to a question but every every response had to be one sentence so uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny yeah so and and just Date the time when you saw this ad. When, when, what, are we to, what, what are we talking about in terms of, 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 of time? Well, it's probably the fall of 83. I'm not sure, September, October. I got the test back. Um, I sent the test in, and then I got called up for an interview. So I think 1,000 people applied in uh, October, November 1983. And then... Um, about 40 people got actually got an interview and I got an interview and was hired in December of 1983. Okay. Tell me about the interview experience. What, what did they want to know about you? And also, did you have any questions for them? And I know we mention Richard Dennis all the time as the name, but of course, in reality, we're talking about two individuals here, Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart. Yeah, but it was mostly uh, Rich's project, and um, you certainly knew that uh, Rich was running the show, and um, that Bill was his incredibly trusted friend. Sure. And um, sure. So I tried to like study. I mean, how silly is that to sort of study and try to <laughs> impress them with all my knowledge of trading? That, but. Um, I think I guess a couple of things stand out about the interview and, you know, just back to an earlier comment you made to set the record straight, you know, uh, my memory is not that great. And then everyone just has different opinions of the facts of what happened. And, and as over the years uh, talking about the experience in the turtle program, everybody remembers it slightly different. So there is no saying sure. that the record straight. It's just uh, what I remember and how I remember it. But, Exactly. Um, uh, a couple of things. One was um, they asked me how I how how do you think you did on this test? And I said I think I did pretty well. I had um, <laughs> just taken this test around with me and kept it as long as I could and agonized over it. 
And I finally sent it in and they said, yeah, you had the highest score out of a thousand people. So wow. that was sort of my claim to fame. I think they wanted to hire people who um, had done really well on the test and they wanted to hire people who had done poorly on the test and had uh, other things going for them. So there were people there with um, better personalities and histories and um, <clears throat> maybe more things going on in their life than me. And they were hired. And then I was sort of hired because of the test. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, there was really one famous kind of funny question that uh, Rich asked me and I think a handful of other people at least um, was, how much do you think you already know about trading <clears throat> on a scale from zero to 100 percent? How much do you already know? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, well, I would say about 90 uh, percent. Of course, that's sort of a laughable, should have been laughable at the time, but I said it nonetheless. And I think other people um, <clears throat> maybe even went higher than that. But um, if I remember correctly, I think uh, Liz Cheval said close to zero. <laughs> 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 so uh, the first year, like there were 11 guys hired and Liz Cheval and uh, so the woman, the only woman that was hired was the only one with the proper uh, amount of humble, humbleness yeah. and reality. Sure. The rest of us were, at least a couple of us were really way overconfident. Yeah. Why did you think, or why do you think that you did well in the test? Was that because the questions came natural to you? Because you already were sort of a little bit familiar with trend following you mentioned? Or, you know, I heard that some people had you know, read up on articles about Richard Dennis and actually could pretty much, you know, get the answers from those articles. Well, why do you think you did so well? I think uh, it was, I just remember looking at the test one day and saying, well, here goes. I hope that these guys are trend followers. And I guess I didn't really remember or get that from that Business Week article. And, um, and another way, another thing too is I had probably some experience in kind of what you would call, um, a contrarian thinking, you know, and right. uh, going for the obvious answer. Um, and so maybe that helped also. Mm. And how long did it take for them after the interview to, to inform you that you'd been selected? I don't remember, but um, another funny story is that <clears throat> I got a phone, I was at an audit and I got a phone call and um a message, I got a message saying, call this number in Chicago. And so I sort of ignored it for a few days or a week. And then I got another phone call saying, um, you know, please call us. And I was like, oh, wait a second. That could be Richard Dennis. I think I should call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you um, you moved up there, I guess, a, a, a few weeks uh, later in, in early 1984? Uh, the in, uh, December '83, um, I moved to Chicago, and um, yeah, I had two suitcases, and I sold my car, I sold my microwave, I <laughs> um, talked to a friend of Rich's and um, a real estate agent, and the first apartment she showed me was just wonderful, beautiful, 16th floor overlooking the beach and um, for $600 a month. And I didn't know a lot about Chicago or that process, but I knew enough that that was a good deal. And so I had a great place and it just was just perfect from day one. And I just love living in Chicago and the people were amazing and uh, I loved everything about it. Sure. You mentioned that there were 11 of you in the first class um, tell me about your first day. I mean, what impression did you have of the other turtles, um, you know, when you first came to the office, I guess? Well, our first interaction was in the turtle class. I think there was a two or three weeks that we spent, um, you know, eight hours a day at the Union League Club in Chicago being taught uh, trading trading psychology, uh, some, some statistics and math concepts that was important to them. Um, and so kind of got to know the, some of the turtles there. And I was impressed. There was a lot of um, very smart people, but also people that were 
uh, had worked for Rich or friends with Rich. And um, <clears throat> just amazing uh, what a group of the smartest people I'd ever met, Rich and Bill and Dale, and um, some of the nicest people I'd ever met also. I was really amazed. I didn't understand why every 30 minutes or every hour we would take a break and everybody would run for the phones to check up on the quotes and stuff. Um, not realizing that in a month or two I would be doing the same thing. Uh, <laughs> so there was yeah. no, no cell phones or no uh, mobile ways of checking the markets, but um, sure. everybody was very interested in that. Sure. And ju just out of curiosity, how many um, were in the second class, actually? So how many were you in total? I think there were like uh, eight in total. I mean, uh, eight in the second year. And uh, so one year later, they just did the same process over. So at the, I think it was around 20 people. And we were all trading from the same uh, office in the insurance exchange building. In, a, uh, in an office, in a building separate from, uh, you know, Rich's office. Um, I think the second group was um, a very good group, maybe better, better traders, more intelligent people. I know I'll get in trouble for saying that, but I mean, I was in the first group, so I guess it's okay. But yeah, it was a great group. Both groups were great, and, uh, but the second group was particularly good. Maybe there are more people still trading. Ray Barr, Tom Shanks, J Jim DiMaria, a lot of great uh, had some you know, lifelong friends. And um, another thing was kind of interesting, just which comes to mind. I don't know if, if anyone has ever mentioned this to you, but uh, one of the most fun things that the group ever did was uh, like once a year, everybody would have an opportunity to go up and trade with Rich for a day. So um, okay. if you get the impression that uh, we didn't see Rich very much, other than that, it's kind of right. We maybe saw him a few times a year, uh, they would come over and talk to us and give us some ideas and some constructive criticism or some new research ideas. But um, it was pretty much sink or swim. You have the rules. You should follow the rules. But it was really fun to sort of go up to Rich's office once a year and talk about trading uh, and talk about politics, of course, sure, sure. and then uh, go to lunch. And uh, so that was a highlight of um, – I talked about trading for the first hour, and then it was mostly politics the rest of the day. So. <laughs> sure. Now, just in the first period during the classes that you uh, took uh, with, uh, with Richard, what were you actually taught? What, what did they tell you? Because it was quite a short period of time compared to the length of the experiment. Uh, you mean the training class was short? Exactly. Yes. The, my understanding is that you were only spending two or three weeks actually being taught the rules and so on and so forth. So, so what, what were you actually being taught initially um, before you were let loose, so to speak? Well, we were taught um, the philosophy of the trading systems, the philosophy of trend following and uh, specific um, entry and exit signals. But it was much more than that. It was a mindset. It was a philosophy. How should you approach the markets? How should you think about the markets? The markets are going to change over time. So these specific set of parameters um, may have to be adjusted over time. But so it wasn't so we were well equipped with um, with training and the mindset of you need to evolve over time and understand um, how the markets work. Um, another thing that is totally underreported is um, the impact that you can have learning from such great um, people and people who are very smart and know how to approach things in the right way. And, um, you know, you just can't duplicate that. The, if we lost money, we were only evaluated in terms of did you follow the systems, not your performance necessarily. And just the encouragement and that atmosphere, which is a pretend atmosphere, that you're not going to have clients 
um, with that sort of understanding, our client, Richard Dennis, created the systems. And so he believed in them as much as we did or more than we did. So um, <clears throat> that sort of mentoring and foundation that we had far exceeds just uh, me telling you or someone telling me, here's how you should trade, here are the systems and here are the parameters. And so when you have to deal with the markets and clients or drawdowns, and uh, you know, there's a lot more to draw on uh, than just um, the specifics of how the, of the systems, for instance. Sure, sure. And, and the concepts, if not the rules, when you were taught them, did they make sense to you straight away as they do now? Or were you initially simply just following what you were being told to do? Uh, they definitely made sense to me. They make more sense to me now. And I was okay following them. I think at that point in time, it was more of when you're in that turtle room, it was more like, I really want to make sure Rich is happy. And I want to make sure that I don't uh, blow this opportunity. And I think that part of their desire for the turtles was to uh, get something out of the turtles, to, to, to learn what we know and what we've taught you, but through your experience in trading to uh, tell us what you think might be some good ideas and some ways of looking at the markets. But I, I don't think it worked out that way. I think people were competitive and too interested in making sure they followed the rules exactly and their creativity was limited. <clears throat> the downside was too large. Um, if you strayed from the systems, at least my my downs, I felt like if I strayed too much that there wasn't an up there wasn't much of an upside to that. And it was only when I um, the program ended and I started Chesapeake that I really have the freedom, and I had to. I, I no longer could, um, <clears throat> I had to be my own person, and I, more so, and I had to I think about it more, and it was up to me what I wanted to do. There was no more having Rich to, to please Rich or to have him um, tell me what I could and couldn't do, and uh, you're on your own, and now, you, now my creativity reached an all-time high. I was forced into it. So after the teaching ended, after the first two or three weeks, what, what happened next? Did you all get, you know, uh, an information about what uh, account size to trade and how does that yeah, work? Yeah, so we, I think in the very beginning, um, <clears throat> you know, we started trading January the 2nd and I believe everyone had a million dollars to manage. And uh, we were using our strict rules and um, the rules of the entries and the exits and the trading size. And then about a, after a week of trading, uh, Rich called us all on the telephone and asked us how we were doing and what we thought. And so I had a really slow start. I was a little timid, and um, I just remember him being very understanding. And he said, well, how do you think you've done in your first week? And I said, well, I think I did okay, but I probably should have taken more trades. And he said, yeah. Yeah, you should have done more trades. Don't worry about it. Just you know, start trading, doing the trades that you should do. So, of course, one of the uh, biggest rules of trend following or systematic trading is you must take all the trades. And so here I sat, kind of too afraid and just kind of shy. And um, but typical Rich, he was just you know very understanding and very um, you know, he just knew how to to deal with people, to motivate them, and uh, just a really kind person. So. Eventually, I got the hang of it, and I you know, started, you know, doing doing a lot better. Um, sure. And and in the beginning, what was the most difficult thing? I mean, was it working out the signals or the risk, or was it really just pulling the trigger that uh, that you found difficult? Oh, I think pulling the trigger, for sure. Okay. I'm not sure why now, after so many years, but at least then it was, yeah, pulling the trigger, doing those trades, buying those um, breakouts and those. You know, going with the trend, um, just a fear of, of losing money, putting a trade on and having to lose money. 
I think. Um, sure. And at some point in time, I'm sure the second problem was uh, getting out of trades too quickly. You want to preserve a profit. That's kind of a, a no, no, you know, you, um, you just need to do the trades that the system says to do. And sometimes the system is going to say, uh, you need to hang in there longer than you, you know, you sort of feel comfortable doing, but that seems like such a long time ago now. <laughs> I know that, um, Richard Dennis taught you to love your system. Tell me about this statement and, and during the turtle program, how long do you think it took you to get to the point where you loved your system a hundred percent? Wow. Um, I think it's, I don't know how long it took me, but I would definitely say that the problem with loving your system is you have to love, um, the characteristics of it. That's really the problem. And the characteristics are you have, um, less than 50% winning trades, you take lots of small losses. You have, uh, big profits turn into small profits, profits turn into losses. You have drawdowns, you have really bad days. And so embracing all of those characteristics is very difficult, but I guess their point was you've done your back test. You have your system. This is your best idea on how to trade and be profitable. So you should, um, love everything about this. And if part of the characteristic of this system is, uh, losing trades, uh, of course you love your losing trades. If you, part of it is drawdowns, then of course you love the drawdowns. Um, one of the true false questions on the turtle test was, um, a trader should love to take losses. It's true because taking losses true, true. is part of your system and you love your system. So I think that now I think what happened after the turtle program is the problem with loving your system and the elements and the characteristics of that system is that um, maybe you love it, but your clients don't. <laughs> sure. So that has a big negative impact on your uh, daily enjoyment of life. And um, now once again, that's why the turtle program is so amazing because our client um, understood trading unlike most clients and um, actually created those systems and created, created the turtles. Sure. No, absolutely. Now you mentioned that maybe the experiment didn't um, foster the result in terms of the turtles going out and developing their own additions to a large uh, extent. And in your case, that all came later, but was there any kind of, Evolvement of of your own trading, your own system during those four years. Not really. I think uh, people, like I said, Rich would come in every now and then and discuss new research, and I pretty much um, took his recommendations on this, the research and how I should alter my trading based upon their research. So we didn't have the capability. Okay to create our own research, <clears throat> or at least I didn't. And, um, it was only, you know, afterwards where I felt more freedom to use my own ideas. Yeah. Now about a year after you started, the next turtle class joined, did that change anything in terms of dynamics of, of the group? And, um, were there any of them that, just generally during the time in Chicago that you became closer to? Oh, sure. I think um, you know, I'm still friends with Jim DeMaria and Paul Raybar, Tom Shanks, uh, Mike Carr. But I don't think it really changed the atmosphere too much. We had more fun, maybe. Um, <laughs> I remember, you know, one of the big conversations that we'd have with people in the turtle class would be, you know, the typical politics and sports and stuff, but really 
I just felt the need to remind everybody every now and then, like, you know, this is the greatest job ever. This, we're having more fun than we're ever going to have in our entire life. We're, like, incredibly fortunate to be here. And it just never, life is never going to be any better. Um, and, and we were so happy trading, you know, a couple of million dollars. For me, that was probably my peak with Richard Dennis. And had no idea that the CTA business would turn into, you know, billions of dollars under management and big businesses. And so it, it was, it was not even thought of. And at the time didn't feel like it was necessary. A lot, the quality of life was so high when we were there. It was just a magical time intellectually, uh, personally, and, um, you know, it just could, couldn't be better. Sure. Sure. And, um, And how, so how long did it, did it last and, and uh, when, when did the, uh, the program finish did, and did it finish for, 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 for everyone at the same time? Um, I think some people left before it finished. It, I believe it finished in uh, you know, the beginning of 1988. And um, so everybody sort of went on their own and traded um, their own money or for clients and um, I started Chesapeake in February 1988. Um, one of the things about turtles were that we were sort of taught that, um, you know, in order to trade, you had to really force yourself to follow the right procedures and the right philosophy in the systems and not listen to other people. So it was almost like the turtles, when they left Richard Dennis' program, that we had sort of a chip on our shoulder. We were anticipating clients or others to try to influence us and get us to do the wrong type of trading, the trading that felt better but wasn't going to be as profitable. So I think some people just didn't even want to deal with clients at all. I'm not sure if they had a bad feeling about how that would turn out or if they just enjoyed the sort of lifestyle we had, which was not having to really – deal with outsiders or others and but it was um it was a situation that we didn't i really didn't know what i was getting myself into and that was came to trading for other other people it's it's a much different game sure i want to move on to to the beginning of uh, of of chesapeake but but before i do so um you mentioned how important Uh, Rich was as a mentor for you uh, during those years. I mean, after the Turtle program, did you did you stay uh, in touch or, 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 or even close with him after that? Well, I've seen him a few times over the years and um, had some um, nice conversations. And then about five or six years ago, uh, Rich hosted a Turtle reunion in Chicago. Okay. And so... Um, That was fun, and we got a chance to see each other and talk about the prior years. But um, like I said, I see some of the turtles every now and then, but we and I communicate with some uh, via email and such. Sure, sure. Now, you mentioned 1988, um, Chesapeake begins its day. How did you... Um, How did you get started? And also, did you know from maybe some time before the turtle program finished that you wanted to move on and, and start your own business? No, no, no. Like I said, I I had no idea that I sh you know I, I should move on or that I would uh, make more money. I, you know, I just didn't have the concept. And uh, okay. Richard sort of uh, decided to move on and, um, do, you know, and I think the program was initially supposed to last five years, so it ended up lasting four. Okay. And I don't think that anybody was looking, necessarily looking forward to going out and doing trading without Rich. It was just too much fun and um, <laughs> we were all making good money and we didn't know what we didn't know at the time, which was the industry was going to grow. So I was never faced with that a temptation to want to leave. So when it did finish, how did you, because it, it would seem to me at least that it was a rather swift transition from leaving to actually 
starting Chesapeake? How how did that uh, come about so quickly? Uh, well, I met Paul Saunders at Kidder Peabody, and he, I had a track record, which was very important, of course, and the track record was good. And um, he gave, gave me my first client. I had a managed account, $2 million. And um, so right out of the box, I kind of knew that I should trade smaller. I think back in the days, the turtles were making about 150 to 200% a year. <laughs> uh, sure. My worst drawdown was in uh, like the spring of 86. I think I lost 60% in one day. Wow. Yeah, that, that's a loss. Yeah. So I was up 200%, and this was on the back of probably most of the markets were really trending, and especially uh, crude. And crude was on its way from $40 to 10. So we were short a lot of crude. And it was just one of those days, the, the probably the first counter trend day we'd experienced. And it was a massively counter trend day. And, uh, you know, end of the day, start of the day, plus 200, end of the day, plus 140. And, um, but in that environment, this is what we knew. This is what our mentor had told us to expect. And we were following the rules. And, Uh, so what? And um, so, but when I started Chesapeake, I kind of said, well, maybe I should shoot for like 20%. And um, I remember doing those first trades uh, with a lot less leverage and risk and kind of feeling a little guilty. Like, well, I know Rich is not watching me, but I still feel guilty that I'm um, changing my approach here, my bus my risk approach. Um But right out of the box, I lost uh, like 20%. Uh, and then I lost my client. So, okay. Wow. <laughs> quick introduction. Yeah. Uh, so by then, I had two clients. I had a $2 million client and a $300,000 client. So I was left only with the $300,000 client. But uh, we had some good trends that summer. And... Uh, By the end of the summer, I was making pretty good money, and I had some clients coming back. And um, sure, because you actually end up the year. I know you were down twenty percent the first three months, but you end the year by being up nearly fifty percent. So, you know, clearly the trends came back. Yes, and I was just not. I should have been more fearful about losing clients at that time, but I. Uh, even today, I, I still try to, you know, err on the side of I'm just going to make myself happy, do what I think is right, and um, you just have to be true to yourself and your system, and not really be too concerned about losing your clients. Sure. So in that early stage, 1988, um, you were simply following the same rules from the turtle program but just doing it with lower leverage would you say i'd say that's about right um i just don't remember how i evolved but um the most important thing about my evolution has been um whether it was by instinct or um having uh computer research <clears throat> it's always been uh to become a little bit more longer term i think that has proven to be uh, necessary over the years um given the sort of choppiness of the trends and the amount of trend followers and computers and, um, you know, trend following can be good. It will be good, but it's going to be a little bit more choppy with sort of bigger drawdowns and you need to have longer term exits, uh, in order to stay in the trends and not keep getting whipsawed in and out. Sure. Sure. At what stage would you say that you started to change the profile of the program? Because you were still producing quite extraordinary returns and all the way through to year 2000, which is, you know, 13 years of trading, you never had a losing year. Um, but of course, and of course, 2001 is really only one out of three losing years over a 26 year period. So that is in itself a, a, an amazing record. Um, 
But when did you start to sort of uh, uh, evolve, would you say, uh, the, the program? Well, uh, you know, maybe from almost day one, I had um, hired uh, researchers and programmers to uh, analyze the markets. And uh, so I was probably evolving, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, I think that was, you know, part of the, you know, Richard Dennis thought that was sort of mandatory that you should continue to do research, analyze the markets. Um, maybe to update them uh, parameters based upon how the markets change, but also uncover things in the past data that you just not uncovered before. So I think sure. uh, for better or worse, I have evolved uh, since I began. And sometimes I've evolved in the wrong direction and had to correct myself. I think in the you know, early 2000s, my systems were maybe a little bit uh, too uh, optimized and had some unfortunate non-trend following components that I ended up getting rid of in the middle in 2007 uh, period. Sure, so, sure. Well, we might uh, talk about that a, a, a little bit later, but in the early stages of your research, what, what do you remember what you were focusing on? Was it mainly, you know, time frame differences or was it uh, market diversification? Uh, what, what, what do you remember what you were focusing on early on? Oh, I've always been very focused on diversification and adding markets and being you know, being uh, as quick as possible to adopt the non-U.S. markets and uh, then the single stock futures. So I've always sort of been very preoccupied with trading as many markets as possible and divvying up my risk budget amongst as many markets. Even if they're sort of correlated, they're not going to be 100% correlated. So I just like trading them all. Yeah, because I was actually thinking back, um, because uh, I, of course, had the, the pleasure of working for you in the mid-90s. And I I seem to remember, but correct me if I'm wrong here, that even in the mid-90s, you were looking at or maybe had already implemented some of the single stock futures uh, as well as the traditional futures markets. Is Is that right or did that come later, actually? That's right. I, we we may not have traded the single stock futures, but uh, I know we started out trading uh, cash stocks, um, contracts for difference, uh, maybe some options, synthetic futures in the options markets. So um, we tried. We did um, other things, but once we once the single stock futures and one Chicago started for a long time, we were pretty much the only CTA utilizing those markets. Uh, and you asked me another question, like what, what kind of other research I was doing. And, uh, sure. Yeah. I would just say that uh, I don't really remember, but I know what I was not doing. I was not interested in, in adding anything to the trend following. I was not interested in anything counter trend, mean reversion, um, I just bought this stuff hook, line, and sinker almost like no one else. And I would say that I classify myself as someone who is very flexible and somewhat, you know, I mean, I would say I'm, I'm open-minded, but I probably trade the original system philosophy uh, as much as is humanly possible. Uh, because okay. I don't know what the other turtles, how they trade necessarily. But like I said, the most important thing that we did was expand our holding period. Right. But um, honestly, and I have been in this business for 30 years. I've talked to a lot of people. I read a lot of material. I would change in a heartbeat in an instant if I could improve. But I just haven't seen anything better than what we were taught especially given the fact that I'm always going to err on the side of robust 
systems and being conservative uh, and not trying to um, do things that are adds things to my systems that would weaken their reliability. Like you said, uh, we never had as good a period as we did in the first years where we made money almost every year. And that's, and I think that's good enough. Part of with trend following, you're going to have the volatility. Uh, you're going to be tempted to reduce those drawdowns and capture profits more frequently. And you're going to be uh, tempted to do that in ways that I don't think is in the long run going to um, be helpful. But um, I think resisting that and creating systems that have a tendency to make money almost every year, um, clients will respond to that. And I believe that that is sort of a trade-off if you are willing to sit through some drawdowns and follow the rules and not have your systems having too many parameters and too many rules, then that will increase the um, reliability of the systems and your ability to make money you know, almost every year. Sure. You mentioned that in the in the two thousands um, was my understanding of of your answer that you did have some other things that you then went away from again um, because you didn't feel that it was working the way it should. So at some point you, I guess you would have been tempted to to look in slightly other directions than than the uh, the turtle sort of original um, strategy. What directions were you uh, drawn towards and, and what made you even look in that direction? That's a good question. I think that you know, we were um, riding high and on top. And you know, since we had proven we could make money uh, very frequently, uh, what's next? Well, we need one thing next is to get rid of all those bad drawdowns. So I think we tried by trying to minimize the drawdowns and and the sort of, uh, you know, bad parts, the, the parts that people don't like about trend following, we ended up getting rid of some of the good parts also. And so the, essentially the way I would describe it is um, everyone is tempted, everyone, uh, most people do it, and that is uh, putting things in your systems that um, essentially um, cause you to cut your profits short. Right. So whether it's um, taking profits or, preventing what you think might happen if, if you wait for your exit, your trend following exit, you could give back too much profit. Um, resizing your positions based upon the new volatility, profit objectives. Um, that's one of the problems with trend following is that, or the turtle trend following, Richard Dennis trend following was, there's a severe limitations on the, um, "Quote unquote research and improvements, uh, supposedly improvements on your system is that they're not. They do improve the back test, but they don't improve the future." Sure, sure. Now, before we sort of jump to the next point, I wanted just to 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 stay a little bit with what you just said, namely that um, you know people don't like the the downside of trend following, but. But I know you've, uh, I've heard you say uh, before, and, and I hope you know what I mean when I say this, and that is that you actually have a very strong belief that trend following is the least risky investment strategy, which to many people is not exactly how they see it. Can you explain a little bit about why you know this to be the case? Uh, well... And I guess it goes to the philosophy of cutting losses, letting winners run, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. I think um, I just think when you break down the trend following that I've been doing and the way I was taught, there's not any component of it that you wouldn't you, you would not want to embrace. You know, these these markets are very dangerous and competitive, and so my first element of my systems is diversification, you know, um, 
I don't want to become less diversified. That doesn't sound right. I want to be more diversified. I want to have shorts and um, participate in many different trends and different markets as possible. Um, number two would be the systematic uh, characteristic that, that it, it has. I want to, I want to back test my rules and make sure that they work. I want my sample size to be thousands of trades and I want to follow those rules. I don't think, um, it's, it's appropriate to get rid of the systematic approach and trade without uh, the rules or without following those rules. I think uh, the third part would be the long-term nature. I mean, it's, I think you should only be as long-term as you need to be. Everybody would desire to trade shorter term. The drawdowns will be less. The pain will be less. <clears throat> but you just need to find that sweet spot to where you can continue to make money. Um, we can't have, we can't build ourselves as trend followers and then see a two or three year trend in gold, for instance, um, and we don't make much money because we kept getting in and out. And so I think all of the elements of trend following, taking small losses, uh, letting your profits run, um, using a trailing stop, paying attention only to the market prices, um, these are all things that are ultimately um, necessary to have a good risk control approach to these markets. Now, I think the CTAs in Chesapeake in particular, let's say, has taken this uh, amazingly great uh, approach and philosophy and mishandled it in different uh, ways. and. Uh, over at different times, and one of those would probably be uh, too much leverage, trading too large. So if you trade too large and you have 30 and 40 percent drawdowns, then the poor client um, cannot see all of these benefits and, and experience those benefits because the leverage was just too much for them to take. So uh, I think as an industry, the fees, sometimes that the fees have been too high. Uh, the, the commissions have been too high, the leverage is too high, um, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the great characteristics have been overwhelmed by some of our poor business decisions. Sure. And and I guess, I mean, during the, the 2000s, obviously your business grew uh, and, and became, uh, you know, I think the largest or second largest CTA in the world. And of course, investors became more and more institutional. Did, did that put pressure on you? Do you think to to adapt and and try and conform the strategy more to the liking of the investor and their taste, rather than your conviction and your taste of what it should look like? Well, only in the sense that, um, in hindsight, it was. I think um, a, a low leveraged program, one that's attempted to make about 10% a year, was uh, would have been a better idea from a business point of view. Um, right. So, yeah, I think. Um, and then I do think that we resisted um, the idea of portfolio management and managing the volatility. Um, and then that in what in what way, Terry? I'm I would just sure talk to you. other CTAs, and they would say, "Well, we uh, if the volatilities in a, in a trade increases, we will decrease our position. The volatility, right. the portfolio gets above a certain level, we will sort of do a non-system trades that uh, more portfolio management type trades." Sure. And I think we resisted that, and I think we were right in resisting that because I don't think that that too much of that kind of destroys the core system and the robustness of the core of the trading in general. But in a period uh, like the last four or five years where there are not that many big trends and cutting your profits short, it had tended to work. So I don't think it is something that you should be doing, but uh, bad ideas um, can work for a long period of time. That's one of the things that Rich told us. Is that um, right. if you um, if you lose fifty percent of your money, you're going to be uh, fired, 
And uh, but he said, you know what? I'm going to look at all of this based upon how well um, you're following the rules. And so if you're making money but not following the rules, you also may be fired. But if you're losing money and you're following the rules, then uh, that, that that's might be okay. Thing. So I think that's sort of the problem with evaluating uh, traders, you know, in a, in a small sample size is that um, – bad ideas can seem to work. And I think that any idea that cuts your profit short um, in the trend following space, I think overall, eventually that's going to um, not work very well. Sure. You know, 2005, six and seven were not sort of great years for, for the industry, although you made money uh, through this. And I guess this was one of the times where a lot of people declared trend following dead. But then, of course, as we know, 2008 comes along, which was a, a great, if not one of the best years for, for the industry as a whole. But in fairness, it wasn't much of a standout year for you. Why, why do you think that was um, the case, if I may ask? Mm, good question. I think um, a couple of things happened to us in 2008. One is we had... A really bad period in 2007 that um, caused us to have a big drawdown and we reduced our leverage at the exact wrong time and that sort of fed over into 2008. So okay. 2007 we were trading particularly aggressive. We got into a bad drawdown and we reduced our leverage and then we kept it at that level all throughout 2008 during a very good period of time. So once again, the leverage that a CTA chooses is so important and right. it's going to um, can have yep. impacts yep. on the way you trade and, and your performance. So um, it's best to have that moderate use of leverage and not get into these bad situations and to keep it sort of constant and choose a leverage that you can keep constant over time. Another thing too is we um, traded more on the longer term and um, our systems underperformed in 2008, but they kind of overperformed in 2009. So right, exactly, yeah. We see this happen, I think in 2012, for different kind of reasons, we kind of underperformed and then we way overperformed in 2013. So it's the yin and the yang, Absolutely. it's kind of a seesaw. Uh, that's one of the things too that I, people don't talk enough about. Um, you know, you're sort of tempted after a certain period of underperformance to tinker with your systems and call it research. And uh, then as soon as you implement the new research, you find out, well, the older systems would have performed better. <laughs> you know, it's just sort of like... <laughs> seen, I've seen that a few times yeah. as well, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, the last four years, you've mentioned a couple of times, and we all know that they have certainly been, been challenging. Is there anything in your, the way you look at it, that... Um, makes you think that something's changed. I know we can talk about, which I don't think we need to, that there's been a lot of external uh, manipulation and so on and so forth. But I also recently heard that um, Larry Hyde at ISAM, that they had done a study going back all the way, I think, 800 years or so. And, you know, looking at those numbers, they concluded that this is kind of a normal phase within a bigger picture. Do you share that view? And, and is it because we maybe only look back 20, 25 years when we talk about CTA performance that we think that the last four years is unusual? I definitely think it's unusual. Um, I think that, uh, and maybe we can talk about this later, but um, I think that it's worth exploring the, you know, the, the differences between um, trend following and managed futures. And so Sure. I think that trend following is um, fantastic when the markets are trending. So our stock fund made 65% last year. Awesome. Sure. And um, I'm sure that I'm going to be happy 
with the way it handles the inevitable um, uh, reversal or um, in some of these stocks and the stock markets in general. So as compared to uh, other ways of liquidating those trades. But in a, I think the problem with the managed futures industry or Chesapeake in particular is that um, we 40 to 50 percent of our risk exposure and risk risk budget was in the commodities and they have just uh, been flatlining for four or five years and so it looks like we don't know what we're doing anymore it looks like trend following is broken but maybe what's broken is you know a, a Part of our decision in making process of making commodities 50% of our risk exposure, you know, the same systems that had sort of poor performance or no performance uh, applied to more normal type trending markets um, give much different answers. So I, like I said, I think trend following is broken if you trade too short term. It stopped working in the late 90s, the shorter term approach, but uh, the longer term approach uh, continues to do very well, but nothing's going to work well. It's working the way it should when the markets don't trend, and um, it's more of a business decision than a portfolio construction decision on the, upon the CTAs than it is um, the systems themselves. The CTAs were really large. Who cannot trade more than twenty or ten or twenty percent commodities have done much better. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Assuming that's true. The, um, that this was a big disadvantage not to have all this great diversification that you can get in the commodities became a big advantage uh, because the portfolios of the larger CTAs concentrated mostly in stocks and interest rates. Mm. Now, before we sort of leave the, the, the subject on, on, a, on a losses. I know that you were quoted by Michael Covell of saying something like, I used to say we take a small loss, but I think it's better to take an optimal loss. Can you tell me a little bit about what that really means and why it's so important to look at it that way? Oh, I think that um, very quickly the, com the computer can kind of tell you what is a optimal stop loss placement and how to calculate the optimal stop loss. And so just don't want to, it's kind of unspecific to say, I take small losses. Well, what does that mean? Because a loss that's too small will just continue to get whip. You just be whipsawed and your percentage of winning trades will be too low. And uh, the size of the stop loss and the trailing stop will have a direct impact upon your winning percentage. And so just because you're willing to trade a system that is 40%, 40-some percent winning trades doesn't mean that, uh, or less than 50%, doesn't mean you want to be in the 30s or the 20s. So you want a, a stop loss that is uh, sort of optimal in a sense that it the winning percentage is you know, in the low 40s maybe, and then you are you don't continue to get in and out a lot, which, you know, you got uh, trading costs, slippage costs and commissions and it, but you don't want your stop loss to be too large. So I think it's just better to look at these things in more specific terms rather than saying something sort of general. Sure. Sure. Now I wanted, this is not specific to sort of your trading, but more specific to your experience. And that is, You know, when people look at performance and they need to decide who to invest with, they, you know, obviously look at historic numbers. But do you think that historical track records are really that meaningful for investors to look at when they do their research? And and what would you and and if you and, and if not, what would you look at? What would you encourage investors to look at when they do their research to to decide? I definitely think you should look at track records. There's no doubt. Um, and the most important thing about a track record is the longevity and um, you know, obviously the performance. I think the problem with looking at track records is that you can come to a conclusion that you know who the top five traders are. 
And so the best idea is to hire 20 traders that all look pretty decent and good and have been able to stay in business and uh, withstand many different environments. But don't for a minute think that you, you can pinpoint who the top five are going to be in the future. The fact of the matter is most of these CTAs and trend following systems are sort of, they make the same amount of money. That's our experience and that's been our research has sort of shown that every different uh, set of parameters will have a, a better and worse performance over time. But after a 20 year period or a 10 year period, it's going to be pretty much the same performance. And I think people just don't want to hear that. They want to be able to segregate the different uh, traders or people into the good and the bad. And um, so they're totally shocked when uh, the best manager has a poor year or a bad period as if they can defy the laws that we all, the rest of us live under. Sure. And it, it, that, that's a really good point because actually without naming names, we've actually seen an example of that, of a multi-billion dollar CTA being named, you know, the best in the world. And, and the subsequent 12 months was actually not, not so great. So it, 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 it really does occur. So I think that, that's a very important point. And in terms of investors in general, I mean, most people nowadays, and certainly, uh, you know, in 2014, they don't really appreciate or like the sort of systematic trend following strategies. What is it in your view that they don't understand, that they don't get and or can't get their head around about what, what you know, these strategies do? I think the biggest complaint that people have now thanks for listening to top traders unplugged if you feel you learned something of value from today's episode the best way to stay updated is to go on over to itunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released we have some amazing guests lined up for you and to ensure our show continues to grow please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.